Oh, it was just so incredibly excited by it all. I mean, talk about in the sandpit, you know, and surrounded by uh, incredibly talented people, Keith Bracey, Barbara Magnet, you know, thoroughgoing professional broadcasters. And I had this, you know, brief theatrical experience with Naya Marsh and, and a, you know, a bit of uni drama and stuff like that. And it, I won't say it was sort of like getting back on the bike again, but it was, um, it was very natural. It was just a fantastic experience um, watching, you know, being in the company of these people and having this, this astonishing freedom to go out into the world and tell ordinary, quotidian, daily stories of people that had never been seen before. Very naive in all kinds of ways, very simplistic. And some of the, you know, the few archive shots uh, of me, sometimes I look at them and I really cringe because I sort of have the same kind of naivety in encountering these stories that I think our viewers did. At the time, we still had an obligation to do some religious broadcasting, which basically meant Christian broadcasting, by and large. Um, and so Kevin Moore picked up the franchise to do an English show called Stars on Sunday, whereby famous personalities came in and read their favourite <laughs> extracts from the New Testament or the Old Testament, or would sing a, a hymn. Um, and so we did this with a straight face and um, uh, it was a very funny, very, very witty set, which was basically a, 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 you know, a leather wing chair occupied by a fabulous old broadcaster called Ian Watkins, white hair, and he sat there saged in his leather wing chair by the fire. And I mean, how come a bolt of lightning never came from the sky and struck him down <laughs> for cynicism? Uh, I don't know. But there were, there were many friends, including Barry Crump and people like Crump and Reese Giles, you know, Ray Columbus, these people would come in and sit with a straight face, with a straight face, and read these moving tracks from, from, you know, various, various um, inspirational tomes. That was fun. All of us who worked on it rate it right up there as one of the best experiences. We just had a fantastic team. Chris, great, Ken Catron did a marvellous job uh, on Morris's novel. And Morris was in awe of what Ken had, had achieved paring it down, paring it down, paring it down. We actually had the luxury of while, while the stuff was being written and we were, we were confronting these enormous technical problems, these special effects problems, we were, we were able to do little pilot tests on various bits of equipment. Graham came up with some ingenious stuff of um, you know, literally using mirrors, 45 degree mirrors, and and you know little dimmers and stuff like that, um, so we could uh, actually a lot of the effects were in camera, and I think that might be one of the reasons that it still has still has some appeal, that it's got I don't know what it is that it doesn't look like it's it doesn't look like it's made it looks like a photograph of something that's happening rather than you know I mean Avatar it ain't. <laughs> It was decided to go rural, and there's been quite a bit of talk about that and, and, and some of the, you know, research and the academic work that's been done of why did we, you know, why did we go rural? And I was thinking about it earlier today. I, not a little of it was simply because it's easy to shoot in the country. You know, we had no experience of, of urban shooting. Nowadays, you'd, you'd probably be wanting to shoot at least 30 to 40 percent in the studio. But because of the way things were budgeted then, um, building sets in the studios was sort of seen to be expensive. Whereas spending an extra four days on location was not because the wages and the time were not actually in the budget. You know, in, in, in those days, 79, 80, um, TV, TV2 and TV1 were still not doing full budgets. So if there happened to be an employee who was available, 
um, that was kind of cheaper than spending money on scenery and props and stuff like that. I think that's one of the reasons. But but um, but certainly the 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 other thing was that we we had plenty of sort of urban cops and robber stuff, you know, from America, and the idea that we would reflect something quieter and New Zealand and rye and that sort of stuff was also very appealing. Um, yeah, so it was never going to be a show about car chases and guns and, you know, um, tons of extras and people dodging cars running across Queen Street. Well, apart from Lisa Harrow's fabulous contribution, um, I think it was John Lang who had the courage to take three boys off the street, plus Tim Morrison. But Tim obviously was a very seasoned performer by then, but three young boys who were, you know, literally off the street and, and get amazing performances out of them. Um, it was con the film was controversial. A lot of people loved it. Um, some of the more conventional critics, good friends, Tom McWilliams, really disliked it. Um, didn't like the way that it was um, costumed up, and you know, it, it was made more extreme, and it, did, it didn't. These people didn't really look like downtrodden glue sniffers you know, who have been abandoned. Um, but again, that was a that was a design, you know, a production idea that you, it's the movies. It was very hard on the boys, you know, that they suddenly they were in this kind of movie thing. But there was a, they were very keen to get back to their mates after hours, and trying to hold the show, <laughs> hold the ship together was quite tough. I think Johnny Lang did a fantastic job, and Leon Narby, um, although we. We did have a bit of tension, um, but it, Leon is such a wonderful guy to have around a crew. He's, he's so he's so committed to, and it, there's, I think there's often tension between the producer and and the artistic side of Leon. And of course now, with the benefit of hindsight, um, I would go with Leon, Leon's views about time over and above my own. <laughs> Muni and I went to Belfast and that was seriously weird. I mean, it was tanks and helicopters and every time we went in and out of our hotel, we, we had to go through a security station. Um, and we auditioned a lot of Irish actors in the pub be in closing time in the afternoon between whenever it was one and five or something like that. Needless to say, when the doors opened at five, the audition stopped. <laughs> but, I, but I do remember back in London when we were, we, we were auditioning other parts um, and we, Ian, I was shooting it and Ian was reading off, reading the off lines and we auditioned Frances Barber, who had a big reputation. She'd done some marvellous work, it, often in the genre, quite tough political, edgy stuff. Um, and, and Muni was, was giving her firm instructions, really strong direction, and um, wanting to avoid any kind of sentimentality. And um, I remember after a couple of hours later of talking to the writer, who was a friend of mine, had become a good friend of mine in London, and um, he had heard on the grapevine that Francis Barber had been to this audition and uh, had been enormously impressed with this director from New Zealand. So there you go, that was, that was Muni. <laughs>